Something really unusual happened in federal court in the Southern District of New York yesterday. I am talking about the Sarah Palin defamation action against the New York Times. And I feel compelled to talk about it and to talk about it right now in my program, lest I wait until, say, the third hour of the program when the jury may return with a verdict. And then it will look like I'm piggybacking on whatever the ultimate outcome of the case was. And I'm, trust me on this. I may be wrong, but I have original thoughts. And I want to put them on record because, well, I've been talking about this case from its inception. I'm fascinated by it. The Palin case, when all is said and done, stands the prospect of altering defamation law as it has existed for the last 60 plus years in this country. I mean, the law of the land was determined by the Supreme Court in a case called New York Times versus Sullivan. And it's entirely possible that Sarah Palin gets to the Supreme Court of the United States and thereafter the law of the land is Palin v. New York Times. We'll find out. We'll find out. In fact, let me not bury the lead. I believe that in an effort to harm Palin's case yesterday, the federal judge actually helped her. Because I've said consistently, and I've been talking about this case from the inception, she's playing long ball here. She didn't need to file this case in federal court in New York. She could have had arguably a more favorable jury and filed initially in Alaska. The New York Times does business in Alaska, but she chose not to do that. And and that was suggestive to me of her intent to play for a longer game. I'll give you another example. Uh, Twice going out to eat at Elio's on the Upper East Side, running afoul of the vax mandate in New York City, and, and knowing it would be written about, was another sign to me that Palin is playing long ball. Because she has very astute lawyers. These are the lawyers who took down Gawker on behalf of Hulk Hogan, the whole Peter Thiel case. She's got professionals who are trying this case for her. They never would have let her go out and eat publicly in a restaurant, famously unvaxxed and running afoul of the mandate and arguably pissing off half the potential jury pool unless they frankly didn't care. Because the jurors that they were playing for were the Supreme Court of the United States. Here's what has happened. First of all, where are we? The presentation of evidence has ended. Okay? The plaintiff, Sarah Palin, presented her case. The New York Times, in defending themselves, presented their case. The evidence closed. The judge instructed the jury on the law. I'll come back to that. The jurors began deliberations. And the judge determined that Palin did not meet her burden and cannot be permitted to win the case. That's not the unusual part. There's a process for that. It's called a directed verdict. But it comes before the jury begins to deliberate. And indeed, the New York Times had made their request for a directed verdict before the jury began its deliberation. In the alternative, in the alternative, the judge awaits the outcome, holding his or her breath that the jury sees it the way his or her honor sees it. If it goes contrary to what the judge thinks, then it's called a JNOV, a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. So there is a process established, directed verdict if the judge thinks that the plaintiff has not met her burden. And if the judge is dubious, but wants the jury to do the dirty work, then the jury comes back, like in this case, with a verdict. Then the judge still has a remedy, and it's called a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. And in this case, the judge did neither. I had a JNOV, so I know this process well. It was in Delaware, as a matter of fact. I I tried a case on behalf of a, uh, a plaintiff who was dying of breast cancer. And she came, her family tree was replete with other breast cancer patients. Mom had it, sister had it, aunt had it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I have to tell you this, my my client was an African-American woman, uh, Karen, and the judge was black. And nobody else was black in that courtroom. 
And did, I tried the race, case in Delaware. Did race come into play? At I all? believe it absolutely came into play. How so? And I tried the case, and the case was a very compelling case. Trust me, TC, I tried cases that were not so compelling. Right. No, I know. This was a compelling case. Okay, so tell And me what I happened. expected to win the verdict on behalf of Karen dying of breast cancer, and the jury came back and, and rendered a defense verdict against my client, and I made application to the judge for a judgment notwithstanding the verdict, and I received, highly unusual, the judge in that case overturned the juror's verdict. And but you know who was, was seat, sitting in the courtroom who? watching the case? Just popped into my head right now. Charlie Brandt. Charlie Brandt, the trial lawyer from Delaware who wrote They I, Paint I Houses. Heard you paint houses. And became the Scorsese movie. Oh, Come God, on. help me. What am I thinking of? Wait a minute. I have other. I have no, other no, no. Help me. Help me with this. We we have to. I I can't. I fr- I can't forget the most important uh, tangent of my story. <laughs> so I heard you paint houses became the Irishman. The Irishman. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Charlie Brandt was was sort of my Sherpa, because he was then a Delaware trial wait, lawyer. I have a question. Yeah. Your um, order from the judge right. came after the jury. Yes. Came back. Yes, that's the that's process. That's the normal process. Right. In other words, in other words, TC. Because I was in, listening to the news yesterday thinking, what am I missing? Like, okay. That's so bizarre. In, in my case in Delaware, and I think this is illustrative of the point that I'm making. In my case in Delaware, if I presented all my evidence, the plaintiff goes first. Okay. Um, then the defense presents their case. Before the jury gets the case, if the judge believed that I had not met my burden then a directed verdict gets entered and the judge takes the case away from the jury. Okay, and okay. that possible Okay, got that it. That's did one. Did not that- happen in the Palin case. It did not happen. But is it Instead, usual for it to happen after the way it did in your Delaware case? No. Neither of this is normal. But the most unusual of all is that you let right. the jurors begin deliberation. And then you say, this is what I think. While they're behind closed doors, and theoretically, right, exactly. in a media blackout, you say, hey, guess what? I'm not going to let Palin win this case. It makes no sense to Instead, me. the alternative is it's a directed verdict before they get the case or let them deliberate. They come back. If they see it the way you, the judge, do, okay, no harm, no foul. If they don't, like my case, you enter a JNOV. A judgment notwithstanding the verdict. A trial lawyer friend of mine last night, we were going back and forth about this. A very, very sophisticated, successful trial lawyer said, for those who care about the sanctity of New York Times versus Sullivan, you know, akin to Roe versus Wade, for some, in terms of its precedential value, if you really care about Times versus Sullivan, the best result here would have been a $1 verdict. In favor of Sarah Palin, not a directed verdict against her, and she would not have had such a clear pathway to appeal. In fact, the Times themselves, instead of congratulating one another in the courtroom yesterday, should have been arguing to give her the dollar and her day in court. But I maintain that the New York Times, and I have great respect for the Times, there's not a day that I don't touch and read the Times, okay? I'm not, this is not some, some conservative diatribe against the New York Times. You're not understanding me if, if that's where you're coming from. The Times is probably too proud to lose to Sarah Palin. The Times was probably just too proud to say that Sarah Palin beat him even for a buck. David Folkenflik at NPR on this issue, here's his coverage. Uh, he broke the story. Yesterday, That's why I, I want to uh, give him the shout out and read from some of his coverage. A federal judge announced Monday afternoon that he would dismiss former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin's defamation action against The New York Times, saying her legal team had failed to reach the high standards required for public figures to make their case. The New York Times legal team argued that Palin had not shown the paper or its former editorial page editor, James Bennett, had been motivated by actual malice in which he would have had to have known that his characterization was false or he would have known the probability of it being false was so great as to mean that he was acting with reckless indifference to the facts. I don't agree with the way the jurors 
were charged by the judge in this case. That's another issue that I'll come back to in a moment. And, says NPR, with evident reluctance, U.S. District Judge Jed Rakoff embraced the reasoning, meaning of the Times, saying Palin's lawyers failed to present any such evidence against Bennett, who had inserted the problematic language in the article. The Times attorneys filed their motion before Rakoff turned the trial over to the jury, which began deliberations on Monday. The judge said that he would wait to formally dismiss the case after the jury's verdict so an appellate court could could consider its findings in full knowledge that Palin would appeal his ruling. Judge Rakoff repeatedly admonished, I'm skipping ahead, the jury not to consume any media coverage or social media commentary of the case and not to speak to anyone about the case outside the jury's meeting room. They broke off their deliberations late Monday afternoon and were to pick up Tuesday morning unaware. And then he writes this, the judge's decision, however, made headlines around the world. How how reasonable is it for the judge to say what he said in open court, cause newspaper headlines to be written around the globe on this, that the Times wins the case against Palin, and then the jurors, they come back from deliberating, you know, in a, in a conference room adjacent to the, the courtroom, and he says, oh, don't pay attention to the media, don't talk to anybody about it. How reasonable is it to think that they were not poisoned by this process? The judge, in an effort to harm Palin's case, And remember, he threw it out before it ever got to trial and was overturned on appeal. I think he ended up helping her. I think he ended up helping her. Remember the facts here. The facts are that, and the facts are not in dispute. The facts of this case are really not in dispute. The facts of the case are that in June of 2017, on the day that there was a tragic shooting at a congressional, Republican congressional softball team practice, they were getting ready to to go play the Democratic Uh, uh, House members and, you know, some person, obviously uh, uh, deranged, opens fire, severely wounds Steve Scalise. And at the New York Times, they want to editorialize, I think rightfully so, about the political climate in which this shooting incident had given rise. In writing the editorial, they assign it to Elizabeth Williamson, who is a writer in Washington, D.C. She takes the first crack at it sends it up the food chain food chain to, to James Bennett, who is the Times editorial page editor. He adds language that was not in her original piece, most notably blaming Sarah Palin for six years previously having incited a shooting incident that severely wounded Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. Incitement was the key word that was used, and it was Sarah Palin's pack that was blamed. What the Times got wrong was not only that there was never a factual link, a causal link between Palin's pack and the Gabby Giffords shooting, but also the Times mistakenly said that crosshairs in an ad run by the pack were put over members of Congress. The crosshairs were put over congressional districts. In any event, the Times goes to press with it electronically that night, comes out in the print edition the following day. They got it wrong. They were flat out wrong. And at a minimum, they were negligent in the way in which they wrote about Sarah Palin. They issued a correction. They didn't issue an apology to Palin. That's not their practice. That's an interesting issue as well, but okay. They did issue a correction. They recognized the error of their way. And the question then became, were they legally responsible to Palin? Sarah Palin, as I've been through this many, many times on the program, but I'll say it one more time. Sarah Palin is a public figure, has a different burden of proof than does a a private citizen. The whole premise of New York Times versus Sullivan before the Internet age is that a public figure, someone like me, look look at me with the platforms that I have, you know, YouTube cameras, a microphone on Sirius XM, a CNN television program. I'm a public figure. And the standard that would apply to me if someone were to say something false and defamatory about me is different than would apply to someone who's listening to my voice right now and doesn't have a public persona. Because the premise of New York Times versus Sullivan is I can defend myself. I have all of this apparatus to defend myself. 
And so Sarah Palin, as a public figure, has multiple platforms on which to defend herself. Therefore, the standard that applies is not a simple negligence standard, failure to exercise reasonable care, but rather an actual malice standard. And actual malice is defined by the New York Times versus Sullivan case as being knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. So, you know, the facts that are in evidence here, for example, that Williamson wrote the editorial and sent it up to Bennett and then Bennett, they have a process at the Times that they call playback. Bennett sends it back to Williamson after he has tinkered with it, inserting the incitement language. She didn't read it or she didn't read it carefully. Uh, I did not read it thoroughly. In retrospect, I wish I had. Bennett said he took responsibility for the process. Quote, this is my fault, right? This is his trial testimony. I wrote those sentences and I'm not looking to shift the blame to anyone else. But yeah, I mean, this is why we send playback to writers because they're the ones who reported the story. They're the ones who are in possession of the facts. And it's important for them to review pieces to make sure that others haven't introduced errors. Was that reckless disregard for the truth? It was clearly negligence, right? Reporter in Washington writes an editorial mistakenly puts the crosshairs over the, uh, pardon me, thinks that the, the crosshairs were over members of Congress in the Gabby Giffords instance, when in fact they were over districts. Bennett adds in the incitement language, sends it back. She doesn't read it. There was no incitement. There was no causal connection between Palin's pack and the Giffords shooting. It was clearly negligent, but was it Reckless. Was it a reckless disregard for the truth? I don't think it was knowledge of falsity. That's what the jury is right now behind closed doors wrestling with. And the judge has just taken the matter away from them, but is still going to let them let them go through a charade of continuing their deliberation. The charge that the judge gave in this case, and I, I read this on radio yesterday, and I think people's eyes glazed over. I'm going to try one more time, and it, it'll be brief and hopefully not painful. But I do want to, I, I want my record to be, I feel like I'm arguing this case. I want my record to be complete. Okay, I'm going to listen really carefully to okay. the instructions. And I will I try not to yesterday. bore you. Here we go. Okay. okay, so I've just explained that actual malice is what Palin needed to prove. Right. And that is knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. Allow me just to read three brief paragraphs of how Judge Rakoff defined those issues. Got it. The first aspect of actual malice you must decide is whether at the time the editorial was published, Mr. Bennett and therefore the New York Times Company won knew that either or both of the allegedly defamatory statements he had crafted were in fact false and that at a minimum, two, he consciously chose to recklessly disregard the high probability that they were false. I don't like that. As I tweeted yesterday, I think that it conflates knowledge of falsity and reckless disregard for the truth, which I believe are two separate things. Knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. You can be reckless without having knowledge of falsity. And arguably, Palin can make the case that the Times, even if Bennett didn't know it was false, he was so reckless that he recklessly disregarded the truth. Two more paragraphs. Even irresponsible reporting or a demonstrated failure to follow professional journalistic standards does not on its own establish actual malice unless the plaintiff has proved that there was a high probability that Mr. Bennett actually doubted the truth of the challenge statement you are considering and nevertheless consciously chose to disregard the high probability that the statement was false. That to me is knowledge of falsity. But I think reckless disregard for the truth is something different. Final paragraph and the pain will be over. The second aspect of actual malice that you must consider is whether the client has proved by clear and convincing evidence 
that if Mr. Bennett believed the challenge statement you are considering is false, he also either, one, intended to defame Ms. Palin, or two, acted in a reckless disregard whether the statement would defame Ms. Palin. That's the beef I have with this case. I believe that the judge in the charge, well, now I've now I've got lots of quarrels with this case, but I believe that the judge in this case is imposing on the jury a requirement that they find Bennett, the Times, knew this was false in order to find for Palin. And I believe there's a separate way that a verdict could have been ended for Sarah, entered for Sarah Palin, which is reckless disregard for the truth without knowledge of falsity. One more time. Listen to this. The second aspect of actual malice that you must decide is whether the client has proved by clear and convincing evidence that if Mr. Bennett believed the challenge statement you are considering is false, he also either, one, intended to defame Ms. Palin, or two, act in reckless disregard of whether the statement would defi- defame Ms. Palin. My problem with the charge is the judge is requiring a knowledge of falsity and reckless disregard for the truth, not or reckless disregard for the truth. Now, before your heads explode, it's entirely possible that the jury won't hear any of that because think about how confusing it was for me to just read to you and you're trying to pay attention and they were trying to pay attention. Um, There's something, you know, that we regard as jury nullification. I think that the O.J. Simpson verdict in a criminal context was jury nullification. The, the jurors were intent on what they were going to do and the evidence and the law be damned. You know, the, the jurors in this case, their, their eyes can glaze over in hearing it and they can just go behind closed doors and decide, was Sarah Palin wronged here in a big way by the New York Times? And if so, they could render a verdict for her. That's not what they're supposed to do. Let me conclude by saying this. This trial was never going to be the final word. For reasons I've already articulated, I believe that Palin has been playing all along for the Supreme Court of the United States. Where Justices Thomas and Gorsuch have already said they think they that New York Times versus Sullivan deserves another look, she's hoping to get to the Supreme Court of the United States. I think that Judge Rakoff in this case, in what he did yesterday, was seeking to prevent a retrial, meaning he's going to let the jury go and deliberate and render a verdict. So the verdict comes in. And of course, he knows there's going to be an appeal taken of this case, but at least they won't have to try it again. The appeal thinking Judge Rakoff, this is what he's thinking. The appeal will be on the legal issues, but the verdict reached by this jury will stand. I think he actually increased the odds that Palin wins on appeal. I think he's actually increased the odds that Palin's lawyers will now get to say the jury process has been tainted. The jury is behind closed doors and, you know, 20 feet away or whatever the distance is, the judge is in the courtroom telling the world that he will not let Palin win. And then at the end of the day, he thanks them for their service and says, oh, go home and don't talk about the case. What are you kidding? In a world where everybody has a smartphone and a computer, they're not going to hear that the judge has just said he doesn't think that Palin should win? Preposterous. She might still win this trial. You know, by the time I finish my bloviating here, the whole thing could be over. Um, But I don't know how a jury could stay insulated from what the judge has just done yesterday. There, There was a lot cleaner process that he could have established In this case, a lot cleaner process. It could have been a directed verdict for the New York Times before they got the case, or it could have been a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. But now it's just now it's just confused. Now it's just totally confused. And what I see, I see people suiting up in their partisan armor, whether they're including legal pundits, whether they're for or against against Sarah Palin. And that's not the way this ought to be evaluated because tomorrow it'll be somebody else. You know, don't pick your side based on whether you like or dislike Palin or the New York Times. The principle that's at stake here of actual malice is too important. 
to become a partisan football. And I know it's probably too late for me to make that observation. That is what happened yesterday in federal court in the Southern District of New York that probably will achieve some level of resolution today. But at least I will now be on record in saying that I think Judge Rakoff made a big mistake yesterday. And the bottom line is this, in a bid to undermine Palin's case, and I don't, I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not ascribing to him any malice on his part. I think probably on a legal basis. He didn't think that she, she met the burden. Okay, he, there's a process for that, and he didn't follow it. And, and in an effort to make sure that she doesn't win, he probably long-term ended up helping her. That's what I wanted to say.